Hello everyone and welcome back to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage YouTube channel. Uh, I am making the debut, and this is not the first one of these I've done, uh, the debut of my most recent Kenmore 158.1941 free arm, also known as the convertible sewing machine from around 1975. You all have heard me in many videos talk about this machine how much I like it, especially for a machine that has multi-stitch, it even has reverse stitches, has a lot going on inside, and um, it is one of my favorite models, obviously, because I pick them up whenever I can, and I've also mentioned to those of you uh, who are fans of many brands that I actually think that this machine is uh, the equal to, if in, not in some ways at least, superior to Swiss-made Bernina's. And uh, I think Bernina's are fantastic machines. They are strong, they make a wonderful sound, they have a great oscillating hook, they're legendary. Uh, they are also legendary for being a royal pain to restore because like some of the other European brands, uh, parts for them are hard to find and when you find them, they can be very, very precious to purchase and then working on them is not always user friendly. The friendliest brands I've ever seen that I've ever come across to work on as a sewing machine restore person are Singers and Kenmore's, and I'm referring to vintage machines, not, not machines that are made after the 80s. But uh, there are reasons, and I talk about this in the video, why I think Kenmore's and Singers were particularly, you can almost see that they were purposely engineered to, to give the servicer quicker access, you know, less hassle when working on them. So, I uh, don't know if any of you have followed followed all these videos on this machine that I put in, but um, I believe I mentioned early on that the person I got this from, rescued it from, uh, she had this machine and she told me that she couldn't get the tension right. And uh, she had a lot of experience sewing. I think maybe she just gave up, had, didn't have patience for it or didn't care anymore and she had other machines, I suspect. So I went through all of the processes and then I started doing some test stitching. And I'm gonna show you the results of that test stitching and what, what I believe the cause was and that the remedy for fixing the stitch tension was actually relatively simple. Uh, you don't always get that lucky, but in this case it did. Now, I'm gonna move, change the aim of the camera so you can see, you're gonna see two strips of fabric here, okay? Now, the first, if you look at these, I'm going to turn this one over a moment. Notice that both of these strips are going to have a white thread and a dark blue thread. Okay, it's easier to see if something is off when you contrast the threads. You don't have to, but it makes your job a little easier. So, what you're going to see here is the first strip is the first uh, test stitching strip that I did. Now, the white thread is the bobbin thread, okay? It's the bottom stitch thread. When you're looking at, thinking of fabric, you have a top stitch and a bottom stitch, right? The, there's a dark blue navy, it'll probably look black on this fabric. It is the top stitch or the thread that you would see on top of your sewing, okay? Now, when I was able to get uh, I, I was making adjustments to the machine because it was clearly not behaving properly. <clears throat> the reason I don't do test stitching early when I first get a machine, I don't like to run the machine. I, I go through and inspect it as I was showing all of you in other videos. And then I start, you know, moving and cleaning because I, I am making an assumption, yes, that I will be able to get it to run, not, not due to any credit from me, just because these machines are very forgiving generally, generally speaking, there will be exceptions. So anyway, I went through this process and then yesterday I said, okay, it's time to do a test. And I did a test stitching sample, okay? So again, two threads. Here's the bottom thread, looks pretty good. You can see the straight stitch there at the bottom and then you see zigzag. Uh, I, I had a shorter zigzag here where my thumb is and then above I, I made the length longer and you can see this, the, it looks different but it is beautifully balanced. And it was the first time I tried to sew with it. But unfortunately, when you turn it over, this is what I saw on top, okay? What I'm seeing is, yes, it's stitching, but, it's, but something is off. 
you see white, which is the bottom thread. Why is it being coming up on the top? That's very odd, right? Now, the white thread tension is controlled. The bottom thread, its tension is controlled by your uh, tension assembly on your sewing machine. Okay, that's this. And you can adjust that tension. So I thought, okay, I'll maybe it's too tight. Maybe the upper tension is too tight and it's pulling the white thread up, right? But it didn't help. So what's the other place you can adjust tension? Your bobbin. Normally, most of your tension adjustments happen with your tension uh, assembly up top. Okay, that's where most sewers end up adjusting tension. But what happened was it didn't help and I was still getting, you can see, every time I kept trying to make adjustments, I keep getting, you know, I should be having a nice wide zigzag with this uh, dark colored thread, but it's, it's not, it's not working, right? The white thread is coming up too much. You can always see a little dot because a perfectly balanced stitch will actually form, it will finalize itself right in the fabric, okay? Uh, people often use the same color thread so they don't see the little dot. Anyway, what was the solution here? No matter, even if I increased or decreased the tension on my knob above, as I was showing you, it did not help. So, what's the next thing to check? So I went and checked the bobbin case. Now the bobbin case is now installed in the machine, but I found another one with the same, um, the same type thing, or this, this, I think this came off of a Kenmore. Anyway, your tension for your top thread, the one that I showed you that doesn't seem to be working right, right? Because my dark colored thread is not looking, it really should look similar to, you know, my bottom thread in terms of the pattern it's making, the stitch, the visual quality of the stitch, and it's not. Now the fabric, you could say, well, is the fabric secured? Well, yes and no, not the way it was designed to. And, it, and to anyone, it, this would look odd and crappy because it is. So remember that the tension of your top thread, which is off here, is determined by the tension adjustment on your bobbin case. Okay, it's, it's th you have to kind of think in reverse. The tension on your bobbin, bob, bobbin case below is what's controlling the quality of the stitch on top. And then, of course, it is the tension assembly knob that is controlling the tension quality. It's this knob that you adjust that, that, it, that controls the stitch quality underneath your fabric, right? The bottom side, because the white is the bottom thread. So when I was sewing, uh, you know, you're, I, I want to see when you're sewing, your top thread is what you're going to see in the stitch itself. So what did I do? I got an appropriate size screwdriver. If you do not have the right size screwdriver to adjust your bobbin case, do not, do not, do not mess with your bobbin case. You want to get one of these. You can get them online. You can get them, um, in a sewing shop, this is a vintage one from one of the many boxes of Singer, uh, Singer um, uh, accessories I've had over the years. I just used that, but it's perfectly sized. What did I discover? Well, the first thing I realized is the bobbin spring was very loose. There's a tiny little set screw right here. Let's get it in the light where you guys can see it. Make sure it focuses right there. Okay. Most bobbin cases have this. They have a way to adjust because this big piece here, you've seen this in other videos I've covered, you see this big little, looks like a, a curved leaf that's sort of clinging to the, to the round cylinder. That's your spring or part of your spring assembly. And so when you turn the set screw with the little baby screwdriver here, when you turn it to the right, it tightens the tension. When you turn it to the left, right, right tight, left loose, it loosens the tension. Now, when I got a hold of the, the uh, bobbin case for this machine, uh, not the one in my hand, the one that, that came with the machine, it was extremely loose. In fact, I went to adjust it to tighten it, and I had to turn it quite a bit to get it to what I consider normal tension. Now, what is normal? There is no number system on a bobbin case. Many of you who have sewn for years kind of have an idea of how the thread should feel when it's loaded into the bobbin case and you tug on it, right? There's a certain resistance and that tells you how tight the tension on the thread is. Um, if the thread just comes flowing out in your hand, either it's not, either your bobbin is not installed properly or your tension is too loose. So once I made, and I had to do this a couple of times, you know, 
when you start changing tension on a bobbin case, don't go crazy initially. Okay, take it a little at a time, and you put it back in. And and what what happened was, in fact, you can see as I was starting to try to make progress. So it was kind of interesting on the straight stitch. This is my first attempt, right? Look at the bottom. You see the straight stitch? It's it's got good, nice balance tension. And then underneath, it looked fine. You'll see a little tiny, again, a little white dot, but that's where the two threads meet. That's okay, right? Now, if you're trying to do a stitch in a garment where it shows, you obviously want to use the same colored thread, but that's an aesthetic issue. This stitch right up here, the straight, the first time I tried it, it is beautifully balanced, but not the zigzag. When I came across, this is what I had. I mean, look at this. This is awful, right? You see all that white thread coming up? It was happening on the zigzag. I couldn't figure out, like, why is this happening? right so I adjusted the tension a little tighter on the bobbin case and the next row down you can see you see where I came around right I just made a little turn and then after I made the adjustment now you're seeing you know you're still seeing issues but not quite as bad but that that dark thread is trying to get its proper zigzag but it's still not this is not what you want okay I kept adjusting and then I got to what I believe is the proper balance for the stitch. Now the straight stitch again was fine. It was fine from the beginning. So machines are funny that way. Sometimes you'll get good tension on one stitch but not another, but that still tells you something's off. And again, I was using normal stitch uh, mode, not stretch stitch, which I would eventually do, but you have to crawl before you walk. So notice the bottom again looks great, but, but, the, but the original test that I did where my top thread was off, the bottom looked great. I still now have very nice uh, balance tension on the bottom, but when I when we turn over, now you will see a very different thing. Now those dark, that dark thread has some nice wide zigzag as it should, and I think over here I had a little bit of, you can see a little bit of the white pulling, so I made another adjustment, and then I got basically right here underneath my thumb, Right there is my final. Now you'll see a little white dot where the, where the uh, stitch moves, right? Where it changes direction. But again, you're going to see that. That's just the contrast. That is where the stitch actually formed, where the top and the bottom thread came together and, and joined hands, so to speak. You're going to see that in a balanced stitch unless you use the same colored thread. But there's now we finally have our, our threads properly balanced and again, in this case, it was the bobbin case. Uh, now, what did I do after that? Well, as I've shown many of you before, and this will be in the manual, this machine, not only did it do all of these amazing stitches built in, it had, of course, an, op uh, it had an option to do what they called stretch stitches. Sometimes they're called reverse stitches, but I'm not talking about going in reverse. Sewing machines have been able to do that for a long time before this thing was built. No, normally you have this little lever here over on the red. That's normal. That's normal uh, stitching for, for wovens and just about any fabric or material you would sew. The reason I have it turned on the toward the white dot is because once I got my tension and I knew my tension was okay, then I thought, okay, let's really push things. We're going to see if the tension still works well when we're in what's called modify, Kenmore called it modifier or modified stitch. This basically allowed you to sew knits a lot more easily. And remember how I, I've mentioned this so many times, knitwear and knit fabrics became a huge hit in the 70s, which is why the sewing machine company said, hey, we've got to figure out how to help people sew these knits. Sewing knits with a regular stitch or with most vintage sewing machines, say the earlier ones, you can do it, but it's just not as convenient as it is with this. So, then that's what I did. In fact, it is currently set up in something called pine leaf, right? I have my selector. Let's zoom in here so you can see my selected stitch. I thought, okay, we're really going to test and see if I've gotten this right or not. And I've covered this stitch many times. Again, it's in the manual. When you're on the, when you flip this little lever to the red dot, then when you, when you're trying to figure out what stitch you're going to use, you always look at the red color in the pattern, right? So you have this one, they're grouped together. So every time you move this knob, right, you get another uh, stitch to select. If, you, if, you're, 
If you're in the white side of the lever, you're going to get this one here. If you're turned to the left, you'll get uh, the one that's red. They're color coordinated, make it easy. It's in fact, it's, for a multi-stitch machine, it's one of the easiest you'll ever operate. It's pretty intuitive. You don't have to, you know, interpret a bunch of stuff to figure it out. And then again, I just turn to the right. There's the rick rack, uh, which uh, I could do if I wanted. But I came over here. There's another one. Uh, a lot of safety stitches. A lot of these are utility stitches used to keep fabric from, from coming apart. And here, notice there's a red dot, sort of an orange-red colored dot. That's always home base. That, to that told the sewer, oh, where do I start? I just want to do straight or plain zigzag. That's where you go. And so on the red side, that's for zigzag. And over to the right, that is for a, uh, this little white pattern that you see here. Now, what about straight stitch? Well, if you want straight, you still use the dot and you make sure that this red dot, they line up, right? And that's where most people spent a lot of time with these machines, right here. Just like many of you still do when you're sewing, right? And then of course, if I turn to the right, I can go all the way wide. You, you always go to the, to the home base of the straight stitch and adjust your width to get zigzag, right? That keeps you from going crazy with all these other stitches. Now, you can still adjust width with this ring you see me turning and you adjust length with the ring down here that I that I have. If you go to zero you get no length you'll get a big ball of a ball of uh, of, of misery <laughs> a big knot you'll just tangle the machine. Why is it here? It's for people who do darning or free motion work which was almost never used but it was there. So let's go to what I was doing before. Where is that stitch I had? Okay, so this is what I was testing it on. I just chose, I said, I'm going to do a reverse stitch. This one they call pine leaf. It, it's the stitch I've mentioned to all of you before. It looks almost as if it's a, a surge-like stitch. It's not, but it kind of looks like one. Plays one, pretends to be one. So now I want you all to hear the machine running and to see, see it's do its amazing magic in with a reverse stitch, right? I did not start with this because, I need to lower this, I want you to see more of the fabric. <clears throat> when a machine of this era does a reverse or stretch stitch, it takes more, uh, I'll just use the term I'm making this up, mechanical acrobatics, it's more complex. So I didn't want the machine to have to figure out its tension doing that. I wanted to start with straight and then zigzag. Once you get to there, then you can move on and ask the machine to do something fancier. And then you see, oh, is, you know, is the uh, tension still holding? So let's take a look. We're going to get it turned on. Again, I have my little switch. Uh, the light comes on automatically. Uh, it's, it's not separate from the power switch like some machines were. Uh, you start to see this all in one switch come around in the late 60s, early 70s. All right, let's get some of these hanging thread tails out of our way so they don't get us in trouble. All right. And I'm going to continue my pine leaf stitch. And you can hear it run. And let's get a little close up here. See if that will... There we go. Oops. There's a little delay when I, when I move the camera here. All right. Let's see. What it will show us, get one more thread here, one more hanging tail out of the way. The fabric is a woven, it's a medium weight. I've got it, one, two, I think I've got four layers here. Nothing for this machine to do. Bump up just a bit. All right. Now, what do I have? Make sure I have my settings properly. I have my longest stitch and my widest stitch. Setting, I should say. And of course, being a reverse stitch, you'll notice it comes forward and it hops back a little bit, keeps moving forward. That is building in the slack. You don't really need this in a woven, but you sure did in a knit. But you can use it for wovens. No harm in doing that. And I can even go back and reverse a stretch stitch, which is interesting to lock it in. Now, I'm gonna pull this out and show you all that a great machine that could not function, that, that uh, a prior person was willing to give up on because uh, maybe they just didn't want to mess with it, 
Again, I've, I've emphasized this many times when I talk about these vintage machines. Sometimes a part of your vintage machine will be broken. It can happen, and it has. I've come across it. Most of the time, what I'm doing to machines, and it takes a lot of time, you know, because I spend hours doing it, is waking them up. They were designed to be used. And when they're not used, when they sit for a long time, in this case, somebody had messed with the tension in, on, the, on the bobbing case. And, or who knows, maybe they sewed something too heavy and it threw the tension off. But um, anyway, this is the top thread, right? You see zigzag, and then I shortened the stitch. So I got, I didn't shorten it all the way to really get a satin stitch, but you can see this, the change in the look of the stitch, right? Then when I came around, I did a little turn here, and then I did my reverse stitch. And you see it, it's called pine leaf, right? And notice it's very balanced. Now here you say, well, why is it a little, let's get in front of the camera there. Why is it uh, a little heavier, darker here? Because I did a reverse, right? So it doubled back on itself. But even then it really seems to know what it's doing. Okay, so this is not a mistake of the machine. This is me putting it in reverse. I'm testing it, right? I'm kind of giving it a stress test, if you will. Uh, now, remember we were having all those issues with the white, okay? You see, now the, you see, the reason is you see dark here, I had used it for a different machine. But look at the white thread, right? The zigzag is lovely, right? And again, you'll see that tiny little black dot there because we have very contrasting threads, but that is a balanced stitch. And then came over and started working on the um, pine leaf. And here you see it, very well balanced. If this machine can do a balanced stitch in reverse, chances are uh, the other stitches should be okay. And I've actually been testing it with both types. And what's fascinating is, you know, today people are always saying, well, I, you know, I, I want to do things quickly. You know, I, they'll say, well, you know, do I need software to, to push a button, you know, to automate something? Well, if you want to go from stretch or reverse stitches on this machine, it literally means simply turning this lever. <laughs> I mean, that's it, right? That's really fast. It's very easy to do. It's not hard. You don't have to start taking things apart, putting things back together again. That was the advantage of a built-in cam system. And that was the most expensive way to do cams. Nothing wrong with plastic cams. I love them. I've used them in machines. I've demonstrated them before. And as often as we use cams, who cares? You know, just put the cam in you want and use it. It's not that hard. But if you were trying to justify, let's say you were on the sales floor at a Sears store and you said to someone, hey, this is, this is one of the nicest uh, Kenmore machines you could buy and one of the most expensive. The 1931 was, was a little bit more money because it not only did it have built-in cams, you could even add more decorative cams. That added us, you know, that was, that was a, another trim level up. But this was one of the most common sellers in the upper end of Kenmore. Uh, very expensive to produce and not cheap to buy if you went into the Sears store. Many people paid, paid on time, right? Or they'd do something called layaway where they'd pay on time, but they couldn't take it home until they had it paid off. A different, a different set of, um, a different approach and a philosophy to debt back in the day. But you can see that this machine is one of, it has a lot of features. And if you don't have the manual, but you have the machine, get the manual. It will be really helpful for you. But honestly, when it comes to a machine that can do all of this, it is one of the simplest to operate and one of the finest in construction I've ever seen. And I don't, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't work for Sears. Sears doesn't even sell sewing machines anymore. And, uh, you know, I have no, no reason to have a bias toward Kenmore or Singer and the, any of the others. Again, not every company did every single model well. There are a few Kenmores, you know, yeah, they're okay, but they're not my favorites. Uh, even Singer with all of their legendary machines, and there's so many you've heard me talk about, even Singer produced a few, a few dogs here and there where they weren't the greatest of models and, you know, and so forth. But the vast majority of the machines uh, that I've ever been tempted to buy are incredible designs and all they needed was maintenance. All I had to do, other than, of course, I went through the whole machine, cleaned it, it needed that. It needed oiling. I even put some grease up top. But the main thing it needed to, to sew a proper stitch again was an adjustment to its bobbing case. And I love being able to access things because if you can't get access to a modern consumer product, how can you repair it? 
and this was designed to be serviced and repaired originally in a Sears service center but those are gone long gone but we still have the machines and we can still take care of them and get and not only can you use them if you use a machine like this and I've told you all I don't think it had very much use because there was very little carbon dust on those motor brushes if you take care of this and just maintain it once it's been overhauled by someone like myself I mean you can not only use it you should be able to take care of it you can still get belts for it you can probably hand it down to someone else if you have anyone in your family that wants to sew uh, anyway thank you all for watching if you are interested in this machine I'm getting ready to list it it is going to be listed alongside some slantomatic singers that I have and whether uh, this is a better machine for you or the singer it all depends on what you're going to sew so uh, a lot of the features of this machine if you're new to it you're looking let's turn the light off uh, are one of the most interesting features other than it has the same level of power that the Bernina does and it owns special feet of course is the presser foot lift space now when you when you lift the presser foot uh, lever modern machines sometimes have a like a little button and it's automated or whatever fine but you come behind it's a metal lever right you can see it I don't think you can see it from here but it's behind the machine and when you push up on it the presser foot comes up the standard lift is pretty high it's just, it's in fact it's slightly higher than most of the singers but you've seen me do this when I was talking about the super high shank foot and putting it back on watch I can push it up again my gosh I am at over a half an inch I'd say probably I don't know five eighths that's amazing right does it mean you can sew five eighths you know, you know heavy belting leather with it no but if you have things like things that are fluffy like batting you know um, quilt batting and so forth it's a very useful thing to have and of course it is a free arm you will see flatbed versions of this machine and those machines can have lots of the wonderful features other than the of course the convertible we call it a convertible it's it converts from a flatbed machine to a free arm right and that was more expensive to make and that's why it costs more you paid for features because your basic machine still had the same quality just didn't have all the features this is of course the little door that you open I was showing you all um, now I'm gonna mop up a little bit of uh, what I did with my swap. I put a little oil here I you can put grease and then you don't have to do as much mopping um, remember what I said and people often forget this they're not paying attention <clears throat> notice when you go to put the bed right the bed piece of the machine back on there are people who will do this and they'll push against it and say why is this not going on I promise you right that must be up protect your door it's beautifully made if you're not sure if the machine is not behaving it's trying to talk to you you need to listen to your machine stop <laughs> don't be in a hurry so I put I put the bed back on like so right now let's sew and I'll take off the uh, the little hatch here to this little cover that gives you access to your bob and when you're not wanting free arm use so let's say you're doing this you think oh I'm gonna go to free arm I'm gonna do I'm gonna take this bed extension off but you you went to change your bobbin you dropped the door but you didn't put the door up and then you go hey I need to I need to use the free arm and I'm starting to come here you're gonna get resistance that lovely door is trying to stop you because you are not paying attention if you don't pay attention and you decide to to wrestle with your machine you will lose because that door will be damaged so word to the wise it's easy to forget this machine does not have a computer brain it is not going to beep at you and warn you not to do that it's you know it, it can't talk to you well it can but you have to listen and and you will not get a computer software code alarm you just have to remember to put your little bobbin door back up and then you can take this off again some of the things I show all of you may seem so obvious you think why are you telling us this I'm doing this because for many of us so many of the things we use have so much automation to them it's easy to forget that you know one of the trade-offs with a robust heirloom quality 
machine like this. It's all mechanical, electromechanical. <clears throat> In order to get the benefits of this, which means it's tough, it can sew on heavy fabrics, and obviously for decades it's still doing it, you cannot rely on the machine to simply make everything uh, automated, right? If your machine, if you're used to it and it makes a certain sound, it sews at a certain rate, if that changes, it is talking to you, but you just have to listen in an analog way. Hope this was helpful, everyone. If you're interested in seeing this machine, reach out to me. You will see it listed, and I'll be happy to let you test drive it, and you can even compare it to, I think I have a Singer 401A coming up, and I have the Singer 431G, uh, the freearm version of the 430, uh, the 400 series, and you can test drive any of them if you wish. Thanks for watching, everyone.